Why don't we take Agent Cooper for a little ride? Where to? The book house. Hello, Khalil here from the wonderful and strange Twin Peaks Logcast podcast, and welcome to episode three of The Book House, a series dedicated to the fan-made materials surrounding David Lynch and Twin Peaks, including, but not limited to, essay collections, fan magazines, and inspired fiction. Today's book is The Essential Wrapped in Plastic, Pathways to Twin Peaks, published in 2016 by John Thorne. For those not as familiar, Wrapped in Plastic was the most popular fan magazine covering Twin Peaks after the show went off the air and going into the next decade, spanning over 13 years of publication and also spanning 75 issues, Wrapped in Plastic had exclusive interviews, articles, information, all pertaining to David Lynch and Twin Peaks, that very much kept the fan community alive and inspired to continue talking about their favorite show about their favorite small fictional town in Washington. The Essential Wrapped in Plastic is a book that connects a lot of those pieces of information throughout all the issues in all those years. It focuses primarily on the original series of Twin Peaks, as well as a bit of Fire Walk With Me. This book was released in 2016, before the return aired. The author, John Thorne, would go on to publish his thoughts on the return specifically with the book Ominous Whoosh, A Wandering Mind Returns to Twin Peaks, which is also on my eventual reading list. I was born a bit too late into Twin Peaks history in order to actually get into the Wrapped in Plastic magazines. So going through this book was my first experience of a lot of this content, and also my first experience with John Thorne as an author. Most of the book I'm going to be discussing today consists of detailed episode overviews, where for each, John Thorne recaps what happened in the episode, notes things that seem especially important or maybe interesting, and then goes into the cut content from the original scripts, which is definitely my favorite part. And then he ends the section usually with what cast and crew have had to say about things related to the episode. Then the book kind of takes a bit of a turn at the last hundred pages or so, where the emphasis changes to essay content, analyzing the final episode in great detail, as well as Fire Walk With Me. One major goal I have with this Bookhouse series is to highlight the different books in the Twin Peaks community without necessarily spoiling everything or removing any reason for you to read it for yourself. And it's with that in mind that I'm not going to be talking about that last hundred pages or so. Instead, I want to focus on more of the portions that deal with Season 1 and Season 2. Like I mentioned before, the cut content is super interesting when it comes to Twin Peaks. I had heard before that David Lynch and other creators made changes to the script now and then, but the degree to which that occurred is kind of surprising sometimes. And there are certain moments where I found myself agreeing with the changes, being glad that something was cut, and then other points where I felt that something might have been lost by cutting it, and it wasn't really necessarily made up for later. As with all these Twin Peaks discussions, whatever you consider canon is what you consider canon. Uh, this material was written by authors of Twin Peaks, but didn't actually get shot. How much you'd weigh these things in as true or not to your Twin Peaks experience, I leave that on your plate. First example that I wanted to highlight was from Sheriff Truman. Uh, there was a scene where I believe it was him, Andy, Cooper, and Hawk talking about their experiences with women in their life. And there was a cut piece of dialogue where Sheriff Truman was going to say at that point, quote, the mystery is what I like the most. And the less I know, the more interested I get, end quote. Now, obviously, if this is talking about the women in their life, the woman in Truman's life would be Josie. And when I think about Josie's relationship with Sheriff Truman, there certainly is a lot of mystery. And obviously, Truman doesn't know all of Josie's life, doesn't know all of her backstory, but even the amount to which he knows her beyond a surface level, I'm not so sure about. He obviously cares about Josie a great deal and is affected by her, the loss of her, but does he really know who she is as a person, I think is open to interpretation, just as it's open how much Josie really felt for Sheriff Truman. Was Josie just keeping Sheriff Truman around because it's very convenient for her if she's trying to hide her criminal aspects to have the sheriff under her thumb? Or did she genuinely care about him as well? 
going back to Truman, if the mystery is what he likes the most, there may be multiple reasons then why he didn't really want to know the truth about Josie. He didn't want to find out something that might, one, make it so he can't be with her, two, make it so he might have to actually bring her to justice, but then three, it also might kill that mystery angle that he finds so alluring. There's a potential read you could do maybe that Josie is from another culture. She is from another continent. And maybe her existence as someone outside of the town and community was part of the appeal and part of the allure. And then there's that dark irony that kind of comes through that because he didn't really know her very well, that's how he got hurt, how she got hurt, and how other people around them ended up getting hurt. That a lot of the mystery surrounding Josie was mystery involved with dark secrets. The kind of things that can get someone hurt. This quote works for Truman and Josie, but it also works maybe from a meta angle as well. Because, again, the quote is, The mystery is what I like the most, and the less I know, the more interested I get. End quote. And you could really tie that in to maybe audience expectations for the series. That the mystery is what drives the audience forward, and not having all the details, not having all the information, makes it more interesting. And you can measure a lot of people's opinions on Twin Peaks with the sort of metric of how much mystery and abstraction are they willing to take or interested in taking with how little information they're going to get to go with it. What I mean by that is that someone like myself might find it difficult to get through parts of the return when I feel like I'm not getting those morsels to chew on. Whereas someone else, like my podcast partner, The Unplugged Professor, might enjoy having fewer breadcrumbs in the trail because that allows him to meander a bit, have more open room for wonderment. Uh, I find personally that Twin Peaks can be often on hit and miss with this sort of balance. And I do think it is a balance and it does have a limit. Because if you don't get anything, if all you have is abstract mystery, I think it's really hard to get into it. It's hard to sink your teeth into nothingness. Uh, The metaphor I think I used on the podcast before is that sometimes with the return, I felt like I was biting into water. There's just nothing there. But for other people, they love that. So I think that this quote, no matter how you, you know, end up dicing it, there is this spectrum, uh, this is, there is this ratio of mystery to answers that I think compels the Twin Peaks narrative and continues to challenge the audience. Also, in episode five, there was some cut dialogue from Major Briggs where he was going to talk about his interest in the Sasquatch, which, if you're not familiar, is like Bigfoot, a very common cryptid urban legend from the Washington area. And also, Major Briggs was going to share that he believed in UFOs, saying, quote, I've seen some high-level classified data that would curl your hair, end quote. I think it's wild how early this information is presented, that this would have been in episode five if it made it on air. And it has such obvious implications for the secret history of Twin Peaks and what Mark Frost would be writing about like 25 years later. Don Davis is on the record in the book as saying that he was told if there was a season three back in the 90s, if it had been continued right away, Major Briggs would have played a part in Cooper's rescue, and he was also told that his character would be a lot more evident. Now, what that means and how that would have played out versus what we got in the eventual book and in the return, who's to say it's all speculation? I think it's fun to speculate, but we just don't know. But this does mean that on some level, the idea of Major Briggs' character being connected to these bigger themes and bigger ideas was already there, even in episode five. And it makes me wonder if the UFO angle would have actually shown up in season three had it happened earlier. I'm going to go on a limb and say it was more likely to go into UFOs than it was Bigfoot, but who am I to say on that? In episode six, there was some cut dialogue from Nadine where she was going to say what she wanted to buy if she got a bunch of money for her silent drape runner. Basically, what was the end goal of making that silent drape runner? And she says that she wanted to buy, quote, long, peaceful Sundays on the water, just the two of us, a whole new world, a new love, end quote. Nadine also goes on to say that she wouldn't blame Ed if he decided to leave her. She said she'd understand, adding, quote, I want to leave me too. I want to climb right out of my skin, end quote. Again, this would be episode six, which is one episode before the season finale, which is where Nadine attempts suicide. John Thorne writes in the book that these lines would have humanized Nadine more, and I really do agree 
that I wish that these lines would have been kept in the show very, very much because Nadine's a character that often gets played for comedy and, and oftentimes maybe in the earlier episodes, like in season one comes across as very mean as very much holding Ed back from happiness. But this portrays Nadine as someone who's kind of aware of those angles and feels this sense of guilt for it. And ultimately her goal with achieving the success with the silent drape runners, the thing she's so angry and obsessed about she wants to do it so that she can make it up to Ed so that she can make it up to both of them and try to start over and have something good. And I think that makes what ends up happening with Nadine so tragic. Also, I think it really does fit with her character overall in the show. And I know that Nadine is fairly criticized in some aspects, and I understand the arguments against her plotline in season two, but I do want to give it a little bit of a backup here because I think that Nadine in season one is a character who is always trying to fight for this future that isn't there. And as viewers, you're kind of led to the idea that it's probably not going to be because her silent drape runner idea is not something that's likely to make millions and millions of dollars, even in the wacky world of Twin Peaks. It seems like she's kind of chasing after this illusion of the future. And then in season two, when she regresses to thinking she's 18 years old again, thinking she's back in high school, she regresses into a past illusion. And there's a sort of, you know, mirroring effect there. And again, more tragedy that Nadine is someone who is unable to live in the present to such an extent where her, her escapism either is to the future or to the past. And that maybe if she can't achieve that happiness in the future and she can't achieve it in the, in the present, she then her mind on a subconscious level brings her back to high school that maybe now she can do things over and make things things right. And we see Nadine try. We see Nadine try to give her best graces to Ed, try to help him move on with Norma, and also try to find a happiness for herself, only to have that ripped away at the season two finale. I understand the concern about making light of mental health issues, and if that is your reason for disliking the Nadine arc, I totally understand, and I think that's valid. Uh, for me personally, I think it works, um, and I don't believe it's as bad as some say. And when, when I say some say, I'm including John Thorne, the author of this book, uh, when he's talking about this season two plot line, he writes, quote, while this makes for an amusing one shot joke, its continued presence in the storyline contributes to the dip in quality of the middle second season episodes, end quote. Sticking in season two for a while, there was a deleted scene with Harold and Donna, which I think would have been very helpful for establishing more of their connection and how they see each other and their whole dynamic. Um, Harold was going to offer Donna some wine to drink with their meal to make it more special. So we asked Donna if she has any requests. Donna, having never consumed alcohol before, just says that all the boys she knows drink beer, uh, at which point Harold appropriately selects a German wine, and Donna kind of looks up to him with this sort of wonder and interest and almost impressed by him. And when Harold prompts her to sip, she at first, you know, drinks some and she goes, wow, but then corrects herself to try to sound more adult in her tone and says, it's very good. Uh, John Thor notes that for this particular section, it would have further portrayed Donna as young, somewhat naive, and her being fascinated with Harold, this older man of some level of sophistication and experience. I agree with John Thorne that a lot of the approach in the show as it aired was on Donna using Harold as a means to an end, as a way to get to the diary, as a way to understand Laura better. Whereas there were moments like this in the script where it would have fleshed out maybe what Donna saw in Harold and highlighted both of their characters kind of at the same time, not just their relationship, but also how they differ from each other. Uh, putting Harold in a situation where he is more experienced and knowledgeable, I think would also be an interesting aspect for him. Later on in the scene involving Harold's death, there was going to be a moment where Dale Cooper was bringing in uh, Philip Gerard or Mike in with the law enforcement, and he asked Philip Gerard if Bob had been here, which is an interesting situation because I know that on the podcast, the professor and I have also wondered, you know, was there any possibility that Harold didn't die by suicide, that maybe he was killed either by someone on Earth or by some sort of supernatural force? And when he receives this question, Philip Gerard shakes his head no. So we can rule out, if we go by the script here, that Bob did not necessarily have an involvement assuming Philip Gerard is accurate in his readings, which I 
believe he would be. But because this script element wasn't put in the actual episode, it still is open. You still could believe that maybe Leland or Bob came by and killed Harold to tie up another loose end because Harold did know more. Harold had Laura's stories and had seen that Bob part of Laura before we see in Fire Walk With Me. So maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't think the script invalidates it automatically, especially since it never got aired. In this original version, Truman at this point would roll his eyes, pull Cooper aside and ask him, you know, is this the right thing to do? You know, the other officers are here. They might think this is silly. They might get the wrong idea. And I think that's interesting also because there was this little tiny arc around that part in season two where we saw Harry Truman start to question Cooper's ideas more, start to kind of pull away from them. But then once we get past the Leland storyline... Harry goes back to being fully on board with Cooper, and this would have been another piece of that moment. It would have been another example of Harry being more questioning, more of a foil to Cooper and not going along with it all the time. Uh, Last thing we would have learned in this scene was that Harold was going to be a patient of Dr. Jacoby, that that would have been part of the backstory. Another thing that I don't think has been confirmed anywhere else, so as far as the filmed content is concerned, it never happened. But if it was true, I think you could then read into how good Dr. Jacoby is or how bad Dr. Jacoby is with other patients, how much he actually would have been able to help Harold, and also how much more culpability that might add to Dr. Jacoby, who already knows so much about Laura, but then you add in Harold as well. Dr. Jacoby, it feels like is spread so thin around this town, and he already admits to Cooper at night he doesn't really care about these people. So there is a question of how much he really would have been able to help Harold in the first place. A couple of things with Leland. At one point, he was going to sing song lyrics from this thing called Pal Joey. Lyrics that are all about being wild again, being like a child again, being bewitched and bothered and bewildered. John Thor notes that, quote, this song was likely replaced because the lyrics strongly hint that Leland could be Bob, end quote. And I think that makes sense because this does sound like very much Bob-like language. However, the weird part about this is that this episode was written by Harley Payton and Robert Engels, who at the time would not have known Leland was the killer. Supposedly, the only people who knew about this were David Lynch, Mark Frost, and Jennifer Lynch when she wrote the book. So Harley Payton and Robert Engels would have accidentally given away too much. And if that got cut out for the reason John Thorne is speculating, that to me would read that maybe Lynch or Frost stepped in later to cut it out. And I don't know if they had to give an explanation to Peyton and Engels. I don't know if they told them anything um, because they can't just tell them the truth that, oh, it's too revealing about the killer because that would reveal it to the writers. And then that could start affecting how they write Leland's character in future episodes. Then in episode nine, there was going to be a scene where Leland was going to order chocolate malts for himself and Maddie and kind of have a moment between those two characters in which Maddie was going to talk about the death of her father, which gives obviously more Maddie lore, which is already so rare in the series. But then also it connects Leland and Maddie that Leland lost a daughter who looks just like Maddie and then Maddie lost a father and there's a sort of connection you could draw between the two of them that otherwise in the version we got I don't think is there as much and an interesting comment is made by Leland during this time where he says that he is quote coming through the pain end quote. So first of all, the idea of coming through the pain, if you don't know Leland's the killer, he's persevering through the pain. He's working through it. He's making the best he can through the pain. He's surviving it. That tracks. But then if you know he's the killer, it's almost like Bob entering through the pain, that Bob is using the pain as a gateway or a portal into this existence, into this world. The third layer to it, uh, maybe more debatable and a bit more objectionable, there is a sexual reading you could do of coming through the pain. And I don't think it's that far-fetched considering that Bob and Leland are known to have that sexual component with their victims, unfortunately with Laura Palmer. So the idea of coming through the pain also has that sort of animalistic physicality connection, which you could draw in. Uh, Needless to say, I wish this scene had been in there because I like the Maddie and Leland Uh, dynamic being increased, but also I think that line from Leland would have been so interesting to discuss and speculate. Then lastly, there's a couple with Dale Cooper that I think are especially interesting in regards to the deleted or cut content. Dale Cooper was going to have dialogue after meeting with Major Briggs that one night in the woods. He was going to talk to Harry Truman and say, quote, The idea that by focusing on our fears and desires about something, we give them tremendous power. Consider this, Harry. Perhaps by our best intentioned resistance of evil, 
we somehow unknowingly join hands with it, perpetuate it, end quote. It's at this time that Dale Cooper also mentions that being suspended recently from the FBI has been freeing or liberating in some way. And there's a lot to chew on here. Dale Cooper mentioning fears and desires feels very much like the entrances to the lodge in the end of season two. And the idea that fear could also be this very destructive force. Also, I think it's interesting that Cooper is suggesting that by focusing on evil, he, in some ways you might be perpetuating it, which I think of my life, my tapes when I hear that. That maybe by fixating so much on a black and white worldview of evil being all around you, you're almost going to find it because you're looking for it. You're almost going to perpetuate it because it's the world you see around you. You're going to make that happen. And part of me speculates then if this kind of mentality in Cooper would parallel well with the ending of season two, where if he views things in terms of good and evil, that's the two versions that are going to split out of Cooper. He can imagine this, all this great evil. And if he's not perfectly good, then he's perfectly evil. It's that dichotomy. It's that false dichotomy that can lead to this sort of limited thinking that I think you can fairly criticize Cooper for if you want to take that interpretive approach. Thus, when he's suspended from the FBI, it's kind of a liberation. It's an escape. It's something where he can put on his flannel clothes and think about moving into the town and try to get away from this great fight against evil. And considering the way that season two ends, but also the way that the return ends, it might have been a happier situation for Dale Cooper to simply stop fighting all the evil all the time. Like a lot of other Twin Peaks books that focus on the behind-the-scenes or production aspects, John Thorne definitely weighs in on season two and contributes quite a bit of interesting information through interview content as well as analysis on what exactly happened during the decline of the show. Reportedly, when the first episode of season two aired, viewership dropped significantly during the first half hour, quote, as impatient viewers tuned out once they learned that Cooper had not died, end quote. I find this to be so bizarre as someone who loves the season two first episode and someone who was really keen on seeing the whole entire episode play out. The idea that once you learn Cooper's alive, you tune out. I do wonder how many of those people that would have stopped at the beginning of season two ever would like, would ever try the return or ever enjoy it. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think the return is built on so many moments of dragged out scenes and uncertainty that are kind of like the season two opening that I think it'd be really hard to make it to the return with that sort of mindset. But it helps to know that a lot of the Twin Peaks fans now have a different appetite and interest than a lot of the general audience keeping up with the show back when season one was happening. And while a lot of people will attribute the downfall of season two to maybe worse episodes in their opinion, even situations like this, I think most Twin Peaks fans agree that the season two premiere is really good. And even the premiere was losing viewers when it didn't have answers right away. Harley Payton says that he and Mark Frost had a big idea for the show after Leland's death, and that was the romance between Cooper and Audrey. So when Kyle MacLachlan refused to do that, Harley Payton says that they had no second season, only backstories. As someone who thinks that Audrey Horn is a more interesting character than simply a love story plot and thinks that that would have been bad for Cooper's character and her own, I'm obviously glad that they didn't have that romance happen and I'm glad it wasn't the focus point of season two. At the same time, I am disheartened that they didn't have any other backup plan, that they put their eggs in that basket, a basket that I don't even agree with. I wish that there would have been more done with characters that had so much potential. We eventually got some things with Josie toward the end of season two, but I look at characters like Hank and I'm like, well, there was some missed opportunities over here. And I think there's still that idea that you could have Leland be the antagonist for a bit longer where the viewers know ironically that he's actually the killer, but Dale Cooper and the investigation don't. And we can watch that play out with Ray Wise getting to put on some amazing performances, being both the grieving, saddened, innocent father to the face of the world, but then also being this devilish, mischievous, evil person to the viewer. I think that could have worked and I think it could have been potentially interesting. I just don't think it all had to hinge on Audrey and Cooper. And I think Harley Payton and Mark Frost had more material to work with than just that. 
Uh, anyway, regardless of all that, uh, one thing I thought was mind blowing was Richard Bamer's response to this. And and I'm someone who really likes Richard Bamer. I think Ben Horn's a great character. I think Richard Bamer's a fantastic actor with that role, and he always is so interesting to listen to with interviews. But this is one where I I think it speaks for itself. Maybe how to feel. He said on this whole Audrey romance idea, quote, "Why be so conservative?" It was something about she is too young and all this sort of stuff. I mean, come on. It would have been great if she was 12. That's the fun of it, to take these extreme rides. Why he got so puritanical about that, I don't know. Why would someone? End quote. I think unless you wanted to give Dale Cooper a very significant character flaw, that would not be the right move. To have Agent Dale Cooper dating a high school girl and treating it like it's nothing is already such a murky ground. But for Richard Bamer to say that it would have been fine or even great if Audrey would have been a 12-year-old middle school girl, I cannot agree with that at all. <laughs> I, I think that there was already problems with him dating a high school girl, let alone if she was any younger. As a result of this relationship not being the focal point, there were some script changes, and you can, you can, as you read the book, you can see some of them. One change that was very simple and direct with this is that in the version we saw on television, Cooper said to Audrey at one point, quote, do what I say, end quote. And in the original script, that same line was going to be, quote, do this for me end quote. So the version originally was more of like a personal side of it, whereas the version we saw on television was more of a command from an FBI officer. And probably the thing that will linger with me the most about this book and the thing that keeps propelling me forward to do more research into the background of Twin Peaks is the stuff with Harley Payton, who is either directly quoted a lot of times or other people talk about him in this book. And I find that a lot of times, even though some people will step up and say that Mark Frost deserves some recognition, uh, and he definitely does, I think very few people bring up Harley Payton, at least the people I'm around in the discourse of Twin Peaks. And I think that that's kind of a shame because I think that he is an unsung writing voice in the narrative. He is, by many accounts, the front runner of season two. And at the very least, someone who brought a lot of ideas to the table and wrote some of people's favorite scenes in the original series. And through the book, you kind of get a sense of his relationship with Mark Frost and his relationship with Robert Engels and the ways in which they kind of agreed with each other and had some similar ideas at the time. It's easy to forget that Mark Frost would say that he liked season two, that Mark Frost and Harley Payton said they had a similar sense of humor and ideas to each other. So there was a connection there between the two of them. Harley Payton also has some pretty interesting inside scoop on what was going on in the set and how certain ideas were discovered along the way. Uh, one example is with Harold Smith. I never knew this, but Harold Smith was based on a real person who actually lived. And that was a person named Arthur Crew Inman, who lived in Boston and uh, during like the 1900s. And he confined himself to a dark room and he would use newspaper ads to hire people he called talkers. And he would record parts of their lives in his diary. He did that from 1919 to the time of his death by suicide in 1963. Never knew that Harold was actually based on a real person. And there also there were situations like with the Black Lodge or the Dugpas where they weren't really original ideas, that they were heavily inspired, if not outright taken almost verbatim from other book material. Uh, sometimes the writers and directors also couldn't even agree on where it came from. You would see a writer say that, oh, this person came up with it. And then that person would say, oh, th th no, that came from this director. And no one really knows for sure where it comes from, but it isn't original. It isn't something that Twin Peaks can just take total credit for. Uh, even, again, down to specific wording. There's examples in the book of that being lifted from other material. And I want to say that even though Harley Payton liked season two and definitely deserves a lot of the credit for things that were going on in season two, he didn't have total control. And there were things he also disliked as things went on. For example, it sounds like he was shocked to hear about what happened with Annie's backstory, that she came from a nunnery, which he thought was ridiculous and was thinking that the show was kind of a mess at that point, or at least that aspect was a mess. I also want to run through some other creators in the background, uh, whether it's crew or cast members who contributed to some of the ideas in the show that are detailed in this book. Uh, one example is the fish in the percolator that supposedly this was inspired by something that had actually happened to Dwayne Dunham, one of the creators on set. Uh, apparently his kids at one point had put raw hot dogs in a coffee thermos and that's what led to the fish in the percolator situation. It was also Kimmy Robertson, the actor for Lucy, who had the idea of her reading a book on Tibet uh, in the show. 
The actor for Betty Briggs, Charlotte Stewart, was the one who came up with the idea to have the character be Catholic and have that sort of religious background. Two others I want to highlight are two two character performers who tragically passed away this year in 2022, and that's Lenny Von Dolan for Harold Smith and Kenneth Walsh for Wyndham Earl. Uh, There's quite a bit in this book that leads me to believe that those two actors in particular put a lot into their roles and really contributed to the feel of those characters on the screen. Lenny Von Dolan says that he approached the character of Harold, quote, with that kind of naked, genuine need to be real. I talked to a lot of homebound people all across this country. They were very sweet and helpful, end quote. And then Kenneth Walsh apparently was the person who was suggesting the outfits for Wyndham Earl, that the costume designer would walk up to him, ask him what he wanted to be, and then he would respond like, "Mm, yeah, I think I should be a fat biker. And then on the spot, they would just make that happen, which is... If true, wild that he had so much control and power over that uh, as far as the costuming. I think he did a great job getting into those characterizations. I thought it was very fun. But then other times you would have situations where the actors would want something and it doesn't happen for their character. Uh, Grace Zabriskie has this really interesting, very large quote about what she wanted for background for her character. And I don't know if any of the other Uh, writers or directors had this conversation with her and we're going to do this at any point, but I just want to relay this whole thing. Cause I think it's, I think it's so interesting that it obviously didn't happen in the show. And this is again from Grace Zabriskie quote, I had talked to Harley Payton and we had a long conversation in which I was asking for more psychic background for Sarah. I was asking for two aunts who had looked preternaturally alike, just as the cousins did. The aunts would have been Sarah Palmer and her sister. I was asking for untold generations of, well, basically witches. I was asking for there to be generation after generation of women who, during one period or several periods of our history, would have been called witches because of their knowledge and powers. Also, in terms of backstory, this family history had been forgotten or that it had, in fact, been denied out of shame for a number of generations. So Sarah is in complete denial of this background, what little she's heard of it, whereas her sister, Maddie's mother, wants it. End quote. Personally, I'm glad this didn't happen, if nothing else, because there's already a lot going on in Twin Peaks, let alone you add the specific verbiage of witches. And as someone who appreciates the story from a more psychological and personal angle, I think having a lot of the trauma and spiritual elements of the Palmer family being connected to generations of witches, a generational situation, uh, it, it doesn't quite fit with me very well. Considering where Sarah Palmer's character goes in The Return, I wonder if David Lynch had a conversation with Grace Zabriskie like this, if at any point he or she thought of what she was doing in the bar in The Return as being an act of witchcraft like her ancestors. Uh, I think it opens up a lot of doors to interesting conversations, especially with Maddie's mother, who otherwise in the show we really don't hear much about. Also, Chris Mulkey didn't quite get what he wants, although I think I'm more on his side for this, at least as far as his character is concerned, because Chris Mulkey objected to the way Hank was treated at points in season two. He did not like Hank getting beat up by Mr. Lee. He called it a racial stereotype of the Chinese guy doing Kung Fu. And yeah, I remember this moment and Mr. Lee is already one of the more forgettable characters of Twin Peaks. He really is a one note character, but beating up Hank like this it really makes Hank feel weaker at a time where that didn't help his character. It did not really help. And I don't think shifting the power to Mr. Lee did a lot for the series either. Another thing with Chris Mulkey is that at one point he explains that there had been apparently public objections to the scene where he and Joan Chen had cut their thumbs doing the blood oath. And I guess it's easy for me as more of a modern viewer to not think about this, but when this show aired, it was in the early 90s and the AIDS epidemic was a growing concern. Mulkey says that Mark Frost didn't tell them to lick the blood. Nobody told them to lick the blood. They just did it on the spot. Uh, Mulkey says, quote, that's what good bad guys do. Drink their blood and eat their heart, end quote. Apparently, according to Chris Mulkey, David Lynch wanted something out of Hank that was a bit different from maybe some of the other writers or directors that were on set. Mulkey says that Lynch liked the razor part of Hank, the more dangerous and unrelenting criminal side, whereas other writers gave him the soft and more manipulating side. 
personally, as a Hank fan, I like both aspects when they're working together. I like it when he can be as manipulating and tactical as Josie or Ben and kind of work with them and even work above them sometimes and get the upper hand. But then I also like it when he's able to be strong muscle enough to be a threat to someone like Leo or to someone like Ed. And speaking of Ed, Everett McGill says that he was the only cast member that ABC wasn't ready to approve in the original pilot run of Twin Peaks because he'd played in so many heavies, as they're called, that he didn't belong on network television. But David Lynch said that he wouldn't do Twin Peaks without him, and that's according to Everett McGill himself. Honestly, as I read this book, the vast majority of situations in which David Lynch was brought up, uh, they were really positive about his involvement. And a lot of the things that it sounds like he changed or did on set, I find myself personally agreeing with. Um, For example, David Lynch added a lot of the unscripted humor in the show, uh, which I guess might be a surprise if you think of David Lynch as the serious guy all the time, especially in regards to season two. But he did do some of this stuff and it wasn't in the original script. Uh, For example, there's a scene where Albert and Cooper are meeting for breakfast in episode nine and David Lynch was the one who added the barbershop quartet singing in the background. Uh, Probably no grand reason. It's just kind of funny. Uh, Lynch was also the one who added in the moment with Bobby and Shelly pulling each other's hair and being goofy in the hospital, Uh, knowing that he also directed the season finale when Bobby and Shelly are also shown to be very cute and happy together. It seems like David Lynch taps into that relationship very nicely. Relating back to Bobby, there's this quote from Dana Ashbrook I want to highlight. Quote, I think there was a little conflict between Mark and David. There's one instance I can give. It was where Don Davis is describing his dream. I had asked Mark about the scene. I asked, how am I taking this dream? Am I into it? Am I put off by it? He said, you don't want to give him the time of day. Bobby doesn't really take it to heart. And then, of course, I get out on the set and David was there and I ask him. He said, no, no, no. It was the total opposite. It was like I was supposed to be hearing him for the first time. So the turn there threw me a little bit. If we go by Dean Ashbrook's words, it sounds as though when Mark Frost wrote the script, he definitely intended Bobby to be kind of aloof and not responsive to it. And then when David Lynch directed the episode, he completely went against that original interpretation, which may not have been in the script at all. It's more just how the director interpreted the material. I think that is interesting and worth noting that they appear to not have seen eye to eye about that critical moment, a moment that for a lot of fans, myself included, uh, we really like the way it turned out. Uh, Curiously enough, Mark Frost also liked the way this turned out, even though it's not how it sounds like he wanted. Mark Frost is quoted on the exact same page that he always loved this Bobby and Major Briggs scene. It always resonated in a way he really liked. So either Mark Frost maybe changed his mind over time, or maybe Mark Frost liked David Lynch's idea more in hindsight, or maybe Dana Ashbrook is misremembering Mark Frost. Any of those things are possible here. When we're dealing with people hearing different things from different people years ago and being being remembered years later, it always gets opened up for fallibility and mistakes. Returning to the disagreement between Mark Frost and David Lynch, though, uh, Harley Payton says that they weren't battling, but he says that the two creators were going their separate ways during season two, and Harley Payton felt that he was in the middle. The way Harley Payton seems to see it is that there were no heroes and villains. Uh, Everyone had their idea of what they were going to do, and they were going to do that. And as a result of that kind of strong, different directions that were happening, uh, what he saw as a delicate balance was lost in the process. We know that David Lynch was gone partly for Wild at Heart. Uh, There seems to be some disagreement about when that happened, but it seems to be during season one that would have been more the case. And then Mark Frost was gone part of the time for season two with Storyville. And between the creators coming on and off set, uh, disagreeing with each other about different interpretations, it it seems as though there was some natural friction, and it seems to have especially been affecting Harley Payton. To the extent that Harley Payton says he and David Lynch had a big falling out. That said, it doesn't seem like Peyton was especially soured on David Lynch or the whole experience, saying, quote, David was and is brilliant. And while I remain a diehard Frost partisan, it is also accurate to suggest that it was David's world, and we were just living in it. And I remain grateful for the opportunity. 
It also seems from reading this book that Mark Frost may not have been as confident as David Lynch in the idea of never revealing Laura's killer. It seems like Mark Frost may have been more open to that as an idea. He says, quote, you can't keep tap dancing forever. And that was sort of David's inclination. Why did we ever have to tell anybody who killed Laura? I said, because David, they're going to hate you if you don't, end quote. Mark Frost also goes on to say that he wasn't happy with Fire Walk With Me being the last experience people had of Twin Peaks. He didn't think it was a satisfying experience in terms of finishing the story or moving viewers ahead. Um, That's not saying he hates the movie, but he doesn't like it as being the ending of Twin Peaks um, or the resolution to move the audiences forward past Twin Peaks. As far as the power dynamics in production, Robert Engels says that David Lynch saw everything. He always got the cuts which I think is just, depending on how much you read into that, uh, kind of mind-blowing because David Lynch will say things in some instances that he really didn't like Twin Peaks where it was going. He stopped watching parts of season two. I've heard some different claims and different quotes in different instances, but if it's true that he always got the cuts, that means that even the episodes David Lynch didn't love, he had a chance to do more about it and just didn't, uh, if that is true. Harley Payton said that David Lynch wouldn't really read the script until the night before they were shot, which then put the directors in a tough spot because David Lynch kept sending instructions to change things way too late into the process of making a TV show. Mark Frost said that he would talk to David Lynch about this and try to make something work, try to explain it to David. But with Mark Frost being busy with his own movie at the time, that conversation never happened. And supposedly Lynch would then blame Harley Payton for not carrying out the changes. Please note that Harley Payton did not return to Twin Peaks The Return in any capacity, despite being a primary showrunner in season two. Personally, I wish Harley Payton could have been involved in the process. I'm going to follow Harley Payton's cue here and not blame anyone or not call anyone a villain. I just think it is unfortunate that one of the major voices of Twin Peaks was not brought in for The Return. I do wonder what Harley Payton's ideas would have been if he had been involved in the process. And if we go by these accounts, I think it is unfortunate that the team was not able to better communicate uh, what they wanted and be able to kind of make this work as a project together and be able to better be on the same page. A particular instance that Harley Payton brings up is the scene with Gordon Cole kissing Shelley. And I know that my podcast co-host and I have wondered for a while about this scene that even though we kind of understand its appeal, we're we're not as really into it as a lot of other people in the fan community. We do get kind of a a little bit of a weird feeling sometimes that David Lynch is playing a character, kissing this woman in the show, kind of wondering what the justification or reason reason for it behind the set was. Yes, it lights a fire under Bobby, but why have Gordon Cole do this? Has always been something on our minds ever since we, I think, first watched that episode together and covered it for the podcast. Uh, But Harley Payton talks about that, and I think this is really interesting. Quote, At one point, David wanted us to write a scene so that he could kiss Machen and Mick, you know, as Gordon Cole. I had a hard time motivating it. And then, and okay, I was being a little thorny, I wrote a line of dialogue for Bobby Briggs when he witnessed the kiss. Hey, why are you kissing that old guy? Needless to say, the line was cut from the script. End quote. This would suggest to me that the writing team did not intuitively think that having Gordon Cole kiss Shelley was a good idea for the storyline. It wasn't originally coming from a need for the writing. It's something that David Lynch himself personally asked for that the writing team had to find a reason to make it happen. And then the line that would have been in there that would have maybe criticized Gordon Cole's role in this, that got cut. And maybe the reason it got cut is because David Lynch wanted this scene to be a beautiful moment or a happy moment, and having Bobby criticize it wasn't the kind of vibe or feeling that uh, maybe David Lynch wanted for it. But it's also hard for me not to be a little cynical and think that Gordon Cole's character would be more palatable to me if over the course of the original show and The Return, he was criticized or scrutinized more. Because when the director self-inserts himself into these moments and he's not called out for it, it does feel a bit strange to me. It does feel a little uncomfortable to me personally. And I know that not everyone feels that way and that's totally fine. So as I'm reading the book, I'm looking at these different situations and I'm simultaneously interested in Harley Payton and Mark Frost and learning more about their ideas along with Robert Engels, while also at the same time agreeing with a lot of David Lynch's changes, even if I wish that they were all communicating with each other a bit better and were more respectful of each other's boundaries and timelines. 
I can't help but feel that a lot of times the show did get improved by those last minute changes or when David Lynch was on set. And for no episode is that more the case than the final episode of Twin Peaks season two. This is a massive section in the book. And I'm not going to spoil what is all in it because it is something worth reading for yourself if you decide to pick up the essential wrapped in plastic book. Uh, but I will go over the scenario because I think it's so important. Um, the original script was written by Mark Frost, Harley Payton, and Robert Engels. And they set it up in a way where it could lead into season three if they got renewed. And when David Lynch showed up as directing that episode, he essentially disregarded the script. As Mark Frost said, quote, when he got on set, he threw out the script, which didn't please me all that much. He would go off and do his own thing. And on one hand, you know, I want to say that that's not right, that David Lynch shouldn't just throw out the script that three of the major writers, including the co-creator, Mark Frost, all put together, that just throwing it out without talking to them, it, it feels wrong. But then also when I read what the script is going to be, it sounds so bizarre and not in a good way, not in the way that the actual finale ended up being. I'm not going to spoil everything because I want it to be a surprise if you read the book, but I will just say that it gets so ridiculous that Bob shows up dressed as a mad dentist. It does start to enter territories of almost a self-parody. It, it really would have harmed the reputation, I think, of Twin Peaks if that would have been the finale as scripted. So when David Lynch like threw it all out, I'm on one hand thinking, ah, you, that's not right. On the other hand, I'm thinking, I'm so thankful and I'm so glad because I love the season two finale. And I know the, you know, the majority of Twin Peaks fans now love it too. But, but even in all that, there were some things that we lost. And one thing that the original script did that David Lynch removed is that there were going to be references to My Life, My Tapes in the finale. So this book, the Dale Cooper autobiography book, a lot of times I don't hear people talk about it anymore. I feel like it's because it doesn't seem as relevant. It's not continuously kept in print the way that the Laura Palmer diary is. But apparently in the original finale, they were going to draw direct connections with the Dale Cooper book in such a way where it, I think, would have canonized the Dale Cooper book. I think it would have made My Life, My Tapes seem more important in the grand scheme of Twin Peaks, uh, whereas ultimately because that stuff was cut out by David Lynch, all those references were cut out. I think the book kind of fell a bit more into obscurity over time. You maybe can blame the book itself for that, but I think that this episode originally would have done more for it, too. Anyway, that whole section in the season two finale is phenomenal and such an interesting read. Uh, cannot recommend that enough. The last thing I want to talk about with regards to the essential wrapped in plastic is John Thorne's general tone and contributions to the book. The vast majority of time, I find John Thorne to be very insightful and informed when it comes to Twin Peaks. Um, he is an astute viewer. He is someone who notices great details, uh, points out all of these different elements, and brings it together in a way that is very approachable and easy to follow and easy to understand. Every now and then, there'll be this great nugget from him in the book. Uh, one example is that he's talking about Wyndham Earl in the second to last episode, and John Thorne explains that the reason Wyndham Earl knocked out Nadine was because he knew he couldn't risk getting into a fight with her. That he knocked her out on purpose to remove her as a threat. And I don't know, I guess maybe that's obvious to other people, but I totally miss that every time I've watched the show. I never really think about him doing it on purpose. I just think, oh, he just happened to knock Nadine out. But it does make sense, because Wyndham Earl was so knowledgeable about the community, he obviously did his research and heard things from Leo, and also by this point, I imagine that... Nadine would be a very popular local legend of sorts for her incredible strength. So I think it makes total sense that Wyndham Earl would want to eliminate her as a threat. Uh, basically, Nadine was the proto-Freddy, if you want to think of it that way. I also think a lot of John Thorne's criticisms of the show at times are very accurate. For example, when Cooper is talking about his dream that he had about Laura whispering who killed her and then he forgot who the killer was, I think he's correct in criticizing that situation. Writing, quote, while this kind of thing can certainly happen in real life, a dream can be clear immediately after one wakes and then details fade quickly, it is hard to believe that Cooper, of all people, would forget the name of the killer. Undoubtedly, Mark Frost had some say in creating the Cooper Forgot scenario, and it is unfortunate that he did not develop a more daring excuse for why Cooper could not remember the killer's name. End quote. 
And I agree with John Thorne here that I do think it is disappointing they couldn't find a better way around the situation than to just say he simply forgot. And then John Thorne goes on to credit Harley Payton for being able to keep the momentum going within the episode by shifting the focus to cracking the code, to kind of redirect the energy toward the mystery of it rather than dwelling on the fact that Cooper forgot the name of the killer. One thing I really appreciate is that John Thorne points out times where there are errors or inconsistencies, and not that any of these I think are really major or automatically destroy the show, but I do think that these errors would look kind of at in context, and kind of when you add them all up, they show that Twin Peaks was never perfect. Uh, even in season one, even when David Lynch and Mark Frost were both together on the set, mistakes could happen, and there were situations where they clearly didn't have the whole show planned out. It was never a masterpiece in that specific kind of way. Uh, so, for example, one of the big ones is that in episode eight, it's brought up that a third man other than Jacques and Leo had been there when Laura died because the blood type of the person who wrote the fire walk with me note had a B negative blood and the other two did not have a B negative blood. But earlier in episode five, it is clearly stated that Jacques Renault's blood type is a B negative which would logically mean that there wasn't a third man or there didn't need to be because Jacques' blood type would have matched. He would have been the obvious suspect to be the killer. And when this contradiction was brought up to Mark Frost in 1990, Frost claimed he had no knowledge of the mix-up and dismissed the issue. As John Thorne puts it, quote, it seems as if the Twin Peaks narrative dismissed the issue too, end quote. I really appreciate that John Thorne is willing to criticize the show now and then and call the show out for some of the mistakes it made and also say that Mark Frost and David Lynch and the creators can make these sort of mistakes. I think it's important that we're able to have those conversations about the media and still enjoy it. Because again, I don't think these issues ruin Twin Peaks. I don't think that they make the whole thing completely nonsensical. Sometimes they could even be funny. So, for example, Thorne notes that on Donna's birth certificate in season two, it lists her mom's maiden name as Hayward. It's possible you could marry someone with the same last name, but how likely is that? Uh, it might be worth remarking upon. It might be worth questioning. And then at one point, there was an indication that the Great Northern was hosting a beauty pageant called the Tri-County Lumber Queen Semifinals just weeks before Miss Twin Peaks which to me just reads as the writers didn't know that Miss Twin Peaks was going to happen, or at least the writer for that episode. So they put in this idea of, oh, it'd be kind of funny if they had a pageant, a beauty pageant. And then, you know, a few episodes later, they decide to have the actual pageant and have a different one. So it, it's one of those things that clearly it wasn't fully planned out the whole way through. They didn't know for sure what was going to happen even in a few episodes sometimes. There are two areas in which I feel a bit differently than John Thorne, however. One is with regards to interpretation um, and that idea of death of the author that I always talk about. In 1990, Mark Frost was asked about the pale horse of death and was being directly asked about the interpretation of the pale horse being a symbol of death. And apparently Frost had substantiated this interpretation, basically agreed with it. Uh, which causes John Thorne to write, quote, because Frost was the author and the originator of the idea, this interpretation is probably correct, end quote. And my objection is with the term correct, because I don't believe there is necessarily one correct interpretation, and I think that this death of the author idea can go in two directions. Uh, first of all, Mark Frost isn't the only author. So if, for example, David Lynch, who was directing the episode with the Pale Horse, if David Lynch had a different interpretation, would that nullify Mark Frost? Like if David Lynch went out and said that it wasn't a symbol of death, would that make Mark Frost's ideas no longer matter and the interpretation no longer correct? Uh, I think that's a bit shaky. Uh, but then also, even if Mark Frost was the only writer, even if we remove David Lynch from the picture, even if we remove the actors who might have interpreted differently or the producers who might have interpreted differently, if we just say Mark Frost is the only writer that matters here, does Mark Frost get to limit our interpretation? Does Mark Frost get to say that it can only mean one thing. And this is where I don't agree. I don't think you can ever completely prove that interpretation because it's deliberately abstract. And within the information we get in the show, we don't get any confirmation outright. Um, that being said, I do like the interpretation of the pale horse meaning death. It is personally what I usually believe when I watch the show. I just don't like the terminology of saying that a creator saying something means it's correct now. 
Then there's also a quote from Mark Frost where Frost is talking about who killed Laura Palmer, and he says, quote, Laura's father killed her. I think Leland was culpable. Ultimately, the human person has to take responsibility, and Bob may have just been a figment of his imagination, end quote. So if Mark Frost said that, does that mean now that the correct interpretation of Bob is that he is a figment of Leland's imagination? If so, again, how does that connect if other creators, like other writers, disagree with that? Because I think there's ample evidence other writers disagree with that perspective. And what do you do with other Twin Peaks material that doesn't quite line up with that? Like, sure, Bob might be part of Leland's imagination, and that's it in the original show, and maybe in The Secret Diary of Laura Palmer, and maybe in Fire Walk With Me, although that last one's a bit more of a stretch, I think. When you get to The Return, it seems very, very, very apparent to me that Bob is something other than Leland's imagination. Does that mean that the correct interpretation can change if Mark Frost later changes his mind? Does that mean that Mark Frost was never right in the first place? That's where I think this gets into some really murky territory and why I generally try to stay away from saying that an author's opinion confirms something. I think hearing from the author can be very interesting, and I think it can give us insight about the production. And if you're trying to evaluate something critically, I think there's a, a way you can do it where you can look at what an author's intentions are and then maybe judge the piece of work based on how well it actually succeeded at those intentions. Like you could say, if the author's point was to make a statement about, I don't know, like racism or something, and it doesn't do a very good job, you could say the author failed in that regard. Like maybe that's a valid approach in some instances. When it comes to abstract media like Twin Peaks, though, I don't know if it always works to take in the individual authors when it's so abundantly clear there's so many authors, they disagree with each other, they change their minds over time, and I'm not even sure they all know what it's all about sometimes. And the other thing I disagree with John Thorne about is maybe more obvious, it is that John Thorne does look at season two as being worse uh, in a way that seems more matter of fact. He seems to take it very much as a given that season two is worse. He calls the section in his book on episodes 17 through 22, the second season slump. At one point, John Thorne writes, quote, Twin Peaks was always notable for its unique and stunning imagery. But the shot of Andy with the superimposed devil Nikki is awful and marks a visual low for the series. It is, in fact, the single worst moment of the entire run. End quote. I think it's cool if you don't like the visual of little Nikki in the devil costume. I personally think it's funny. But I think regardless of how you feel, whether you think it's funny or not funny, I don't agree with stating outright it is, in fact, the single worst moment. There's no facts. At the end of the day, this is subjective art. Uh, there is no factual stance. There is no objective sense in which this is the best or this is the worst. I don't think it's clearly automatically a visual low if you enjoy it. If you find the little Nikki scene to be interesting or funny, you think that the idea of having little Nikki in the devil costume is, is, a, is a funny thing. Uh, you can't be proven wrong for your sense of humor. Thorne makes a similar argument about the wine tasting party with Dick Tremaine, saying that it relies too much on goofy slapstick comedy and that Buchanan and that Ian Buchanan's performance is good, but he thinks it's wasted on a superfluous scene. I like the wine tasting scene. That doesn't mean I'm viewing the show wrong. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's automatically a bad thing. And, and maybe that's not what John Thorne means. Maybe he is acknowledging it as that subjective element. It's, it's more the, the nitpicky feeling I have about wording that kind of sticks out to me. All in all, I have tremendous respect for John Thorne. And between him and Craig Miller, I don't even know if we would have the Twin Peaks community that we have now if it wasn't for Wrapped in Plastic. And I think this book is so cool for being a way to collect all of these different things over the years and read about them and have kind of a, a resource guide to the breakdown of the behind the scenes and all of the different episodes. Um, I especially like the context that you get for the behind the scenes production of Twin Peaks, the script changes, and personally finding out more about Harley Payton, I thought was really fun. Again, I have deliberately left out discussing the last 100 or so pages of the book, which include essay content on the final episode of the original series and a ton of discussion on Fire Walk With Me. There's also an interview with the late Frank Silva, who played Bob. If you are interested in reading The Essential Wrapped in Plastic for yourself and experiencing more of it, I would recommend you support the author and purchase your very own copy through Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and other retail providers. 
If you end up checking out this book for yourself, I would love to hear from you. What did you think about it? What did it spark in your mind? Or if you have any suggestions for other books or fan material you would like to see me check out for the bookhouse, those would be rather swell as well. And you can drop those in the YouTube comments or email me at snakeeyedreams at gmail.com or send me a tweet at snakeeyedreams1. That's the numeral one, as in I have one more thing to leave you with before I need to brush my teeth. Next time on The Bookhouse is In Heaven, Everything is Fine. Fiction inspired by David Lynch, edited by Cameron Pierce. Make sure to follow Snake Eye Dreams on Twitter or subscribe on YouTube if you want to know when the next episode drops. And for now, that's all she wrote. So until I see you again in 25 years, ciao.